So guys, today we're going to talk about pneumothoraxes, aka a collapsed lung due to air entering into the pleural cavity. So let's get into it. Um, anatomy is pretty simple here. You got the pleural cavity where the lungs live, um, the trachea, because you'll see here actually it's shifted and we'll have another picture that kind of shows you like, look at it, it goes away from this area because now this is the area of negative pressure. Think of like something sucking it in. So like, basically I think of like you grab your arm and you like suck it in that whole area, that skin pops up kind of like how if you use like suction cups on a patient, it like pops up that like negative pressure is what keeps the lungs inflated. So it pulls it towards, pulls all the air. in. I think of like a turkey baster when you squeeze it and then you let it out. That's like the negative pressure sucking it all in. Um, that's why the lungs need negative pressure. So if any air gets into the lungs, it becomes positive pressure and then it doesn't work anymore. So that's not good. Um, so the etiology of how this happens, again, positive pressure enters into the lungs in some sort of way, which causes the lung to collapse. So now the lung is no longer inflated. It's just a flat pancake and not working. Flat pancakes can't get oxygen in and flat pancakes can't uh, allow gas exchange. So therefore two flat pancakes equals you're dead. So don't do that. Um, basically this, this can occur spontaneously, which is really scary. Um, it's called spontaneous atelectasis, um, which is not good, uh, but usually there's a reason why it's happening. And you, it's very important that you keep the reason why it's happening in mind because it's really gonna make a difference in what you're doing treatment wise. So here are the following reasons. Trauma due to a punctured or fractured rib so the rib breaks punctures along you know it's like a balloon pop push becomes a flat pancake like how a balloon once you pop it becomes a flat pancake um i'm using this flat pancake a lot guys so that's not good this is what happens to actually my hairdresser uh he got in a motorcycle motorbike accident flipped over the handlebars because a deer came out of nowhere you know trauma fractures ribs all that stuff but he is good all good he does my hair now, so everything's fine. Um, so that can happen to people. Very scary. Uh, pulmonary diseases such as COPD, um, so like emphysema, cystic fibrosis, chronic, any sort of obstructive pulmonary disease can definitely get to the point where it causes the lung to collapse. That's why we really don't want patients to have these to begin with because they're bad. Um, restrictive lung diseases, so like pulmonary fibrosis, uh, systemic sclerosis, sarcoidosis, all of that stuff can also cause um, a lung to collapse uh, due to the increase in pressure in that side of the lung. So like even like scoliosis can cause so much pressure on that side that the lung just collapses. So not ideal. Um, this is probably one of the more common ones that you will encounter in your career of like infectious diseases causing um, the lung to collapse. So pneumonia ends up being a big one. Again, an increase in pressure causes the lung to collapse. The important thing about this word, pneumothorax, pneumo being air, thorax, the thorax, air in the thorax. You can also have a hydrothorax, which means you have water in the thorax. You can have, there's another one, uh, hemothorax, where you have blood in the pleural cavity. Um, basically anything that's going to cause the pressure to increase in that side of the lung, which then will cause the lung to collapse because the lungs are negative Nancy's and they don't want positive pressure. They want the negative pressure. Uh, so not good at all. Um, all the systemic disorders, this connective tissue disorders, I think we talked about it in another video, how this can cause an aneurysm um, due to like something like EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I have another video on that. Um, that can definitely cause lots of problems. Rheumatoid arthritis, lots of problems, systemic sclerosis, that's going to affect all of those connective tissue in your body, making them hard. Again, if the connective tissue is hard, it's not going to do well. If it's too stretchy, it's also not going to do well. And then RA tends to cause a lot of problems. So all of those disorders can cause the lungs to collapse. And then cancer mets in the um, lungs can also cause the lung to collapse. So lung cancer, or if it's metastasized by from any other point to the lungs, because the lungs are one of the primary areas of metastases, uh, that's going to cause some problems. Lots of problems. Uh, so another, basically just anything that's making the lungs go out of whack and then they just collapse and then they're sad. So we don't want to do that. Um, and remember, if you see the word atelectasis, that is how you pronounce this word. I used to call it atelectasis. Um, I've heard lots of fun pronunciations of this word. It is atelectasis. That is the official pronunciation. So now you know, um, because it took me a very long time to figure out this, which if you see that, that is a collapsed lung. So you'll have elect atelectasis secondary to pneumothorax, secondary to 
fractured rib. So that's kind of how it might be um, worded in the chart. So if you see that, that's what it means. So no need, to, no need to panic with the big words, guys. We just learn them, just like how we learn the words in school. It's okay. We got this. Um, so what does it look like? So this is the same picture from earlier, but I kind of showed you all of this stuff. So this is what's going on. So the black space here, that is the lung collapsing. This is actually what's, what's kind of left of the lung, which is not good. Um, this is parts of the heart as well. Uh, so again, not ideal. There's a huge shift over here. That is not good. Sorry for yawning, guys. I've been yawning in a lot of these. I apologize. Um, so we have the trachea shifting. So that's because um, the negative pressure is over here. So it's like sucking it over. So because we have the positive pressure, it'll shift. So this is one of like, I have heard radiologists say that they notice the shift in the trachea before they even notice the, ooh, the ominous void of no lung there. Um, and so you'll see that the whole heart and the mediastinum, that's what this is called, shifts over. Um, again, other symptoms with the patient is that they're going to have difficulty breathing. They will not be having normal breathing patterns that will because it's not good. Uh, they might even be attacked to kipnic because um, they're trying to like breathe, <laughs> trying to get air in. They might be panicking, um, which because they've lost half of their gas exchange, which is not good. Uh, they're going to have a lower SpO2 than normal. So you're going to see their uh, pulse ox sats dropping. Um, you might even see them turning blue or if it goes on for a while and they don't notice because there has been cases of patients who just didn't notice their lung collapse, which I feel like I'd notice that, but things happen. Um, Oh, the clubbing of the digits. The digits will club. So that's where it's like they get the really beefy, thick looking uh, fingers that are like curved at the top. Um, if you look up, if you just type in clubbing fingers, you'll see pictures of them like, you know, big fat fingers uh, due to decreased oxygen perforation to the distal tissues in the like fingers. Uh, you'll also see decreased chest wall expansion, which makes sense. It's not expanding because there's no lung there to expand. Um pretty straightforward, that tracheal shift that I showed, showed you before on this x-ray. Um, again, just be familiar with the x-rays and stuff like that. It's important to kind of know what's going on so because you, you will be able to, you know, do a chart review and see the patient's imaging. So that's something that you just want to keep in mind. Again, we're not like diagnosing this or anything like, ooh, that is a very large tracheal shift. No, we're not, we're not doing something like that. We're just noticing things. Uh, chest pain, probably because there's no lung there. Uh, hypotension can happen. And this is due to the, like, you know, the ch pressure changes and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't allow improvements with venous return due to the collapse of the lung in that cavity. So you'll see the blood pressure kind of drop similarly to how there's decreased venous return when a patient's not pumping their ankle sort of thing. Um, I talked about problems with breathing uh, and you'll see decreased or you'll hear decreased or absent breath sounds in that area, which makes sense because there's no air going through that. So you're not going to hear anything. So if you oscillate, put your stethoscope over that part of the lung, you're not going to hear much going on. So treatment, if we suspect this, like someone's just, you know, casually walking around with a pneumothorax and doesn't realize it, they need immediate medical attention. So send them to the ER because this could get worse and cause the other, if the one lung randomly collapses, what's to stop the other one? Like if both lungs collapse, that's when you're screwed. Um, we don't want that. Uh, generally, we're working on cardiopulmonary physical therapy with this patient. So using incentive spirometers. So remember, you only inhale with those uh, breathing techniques, such as segmental breathing, which this is super cool, guys. Stand up because this is going to be easier. So if you see my little thing in the top right corner, hello. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see this. So top right hand corner, or I guess now I'm here the whole, hi, I'm the whole screen now. So what you're going to want to do is find your rib cage and you'll put your hand right here. Okay. So like on the bottom part of your lower lobe, but I want the cue you'll give patients to say, okay, I want you to breathe into my hand. Okay. So it's like giving tactile feedback that I'm like, I really want that part to breathe because I could go over here and say, all right, breathe into this hand. Like you can see, it's like more intense breathing into that part. So you're finding different parts. So maybe here and you're saying, all right, I want you to breathe into this part. Like you're really trying to expand the lungs into that specific part. So that's like mental breathing. If you have like a part of the lungs that's like not working, um, you're definitely going to want to put it, do stuff over that part of the lungs because it's going to help the patient breathe a little bit better because it's a very scary thing when they like can't expand their lungs in that area. 
So just understanding that. Um, Ooh, where'd my screen go? There it is. Hello, friends. All right. So that's segmental breathing. Um, inspiratory hold to be you breathe in as much as you can. And then you hold it. And then breathe out. That's kind of what it is. So it's to increase oxygen perfusion to the tissues while also working on increasing, you know, breathing capacity. Patient might need surgery. So just keep that in mind. Um, they might have had some sort of surgery to correct this. So just be aware that there's an incision there. Surgery makes it possible that it happens again. Um, there's some cool techniques they can use. Let's be honest, but just be aware, post surgical complications, that's what makes sense. Um, big thing, guys, is what I was mentioning earlier. There's probably a reason why this happens. So like, even if it's just like a fractured rib, now you know that area is sensitive. So maybe you don't do segmental breathing over the fractured rib because um, it's going to be too painful for the patient. Uh, maybe also the patient's got COPD, so they already have difficulty breathing. So you're going to want to, you know, do PERSA breathing, other things. That are not good. I'm so sorry. Um, another thing that you're going to want to make sure that you're doing with this patient is, um, and yeah, any of the reasons why they might have had it, just keep those in mind because there's going to be other precautions associated with that. If it's a restrictive lung disease and it's like scoliosis and that's why it collapsed, like you understand that they're going to have problems with like maintaining upright posture and stuff like that. So just keep all those in mind because there's usually more than one thing going on with this. And that's why everyone gets annoyed with the cardiopulmonary stuff because they're like, there's so much happening and everything's affected. Yeah, because we, yeah, that's just how it works. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Um, but yes, general cardiovascular endurance is going to be good for this patient, just working on walking, ambulation, breathing, getting them back to whatever they were doing, especially if they were like a young person or like a hairdresser who was like, got to stand on his feet all day and work and he walks around and does massage therapy and stuff like that. Like my dude does a lot of things. Um, wanted to get him up and moving. So he went to inpatient rehab to get that done, uh, which worked really well for him. Um, being cautious because there's a chance it can happen again. So keep an eye out for the patient, watch for vitals. If you see some tank and like blood pressure, oxygen saturation, immediate call for, you know, assistance, like that's, that's a medical emergency. So just be aware of that when you're treating the patient. All right, guys, keywords are atelectasis. If you see that probably just associated with collapsed lung, pneumothorax is the most common type of atelectasis. So that's why we're learning it for the boards, um, fractured rib which means breathing problems. So again, I feel like a lot of times this shows up on like, you know, like practice tests as like a uh, um, fractured rib. And that's how they ended up with a pneumothorax. If you see decreased chest wall expansion. So you can see that upon seeing the patient, you must just see. And you can see like only one side of the body is like breathing and you're like, that's not right. Um, segmental breathing as the intervention, very key. Um, it's a new thing that's been added to uh, the boards and it wasn't super common, but it's in the therapy ed book. It's not in the score builders book, uh, at least not in the one that I have right now. It's probably in the updated one. Uh, and then air in the pleural cavity is the definition of a pneumothorax. And then that tracheal shift that you guys saw in the x-ray, definitely going to be important. All right, friends, sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with a pneumothorax in their left lower lobe. The therapist observes the patient's breathing and vital signs. Which of the following would the therapist least expect to, see, to observe with this patient? One, eupnea. Two, decreased chest wall expansion. Three, decreased SpO2. Or four, absent breath sound. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the least thing we're going to see with this patient is eupnea. So that is true normal breathing. So they are not breathing normally. Basically, the video got cut off, but pretty much what's happening is that eupnea is normal breathing. And if they have a pneumothorax, it will not be normal breathing. Um, decreased chest wall expansion, you will definitely see. And then decreased SpO2, you will also definitely see. Um, so that's what I was meaning to say. And then the video somehow got cut off. So thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.